Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters. This is Brother Uriah again from the Hebrew Israelite Home Bible Study Group of Pensacola, Florida. Tonight I have the great pleasure again of presenting to you part three of Knowing Your Bible, entitled The Translators and the Masoretic Text. Tonight we're going to be going over again the translators of the KJV. As we recall from last study, we saw that there were three groups, three sites actually, and each site had two groups that worked upon the translation. There was a site at the Oxford, the Westminster, and the Cambridge. Each site had two groups. Tonight we're going to focus in on the group that was responsible for the translation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament. We have to do this because we want to know, because I have never seen it before, anywhere where, uh, certainly not in any Bible study in the churches back in the old Christian church days, I never heard anybody uh, identify who these translators were. I doubt if Reverend Porkchop knew himself. I'm sorry, Reverend whoever his name was. Um, but tonight we're going to be taking a closer look at these men, all men, all Gentiles, all very scholarly men. And by the way, for those Hebrew Israelites who have a problem with white people, uh, playing a role in this, well, you get ready for some more surprised and being startled because all of these men were white men the ones that some of you call Esau all right so we're going to go through um, their names we're going to honor each one of these men by calling their name a little bit of their bio I know this is not going to be everybody's cup of tea because I know there are a lot of people out here, they just want a lot of hooping and hollering and fussing and yelling and cussing and acting a fool. Uh, but uh, 
that's not we're doing what we're doing here this is a scholarly study the scripture tells us to study study not act a fool study to show thyself approved while i'm at it as i've said so many many times before this was wrong with some of these christian church bible studies they don't really study all they're really doing is reading but so tonight we're going to identify these uh old testament translators and we're going to connect the dots between them and the source that they used to do the translation the source that they use is the Masoretic text. We're going to take a quick look at these Mes the Masoretic texts. We're going to take a look at the Masoretes, identifying who they were and some of the great impact that they've had. Because not only did these Masoretes uh, 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 transcribe, but they also changed. They also changed the text, and they added these markings that we call vowel markings or sometimes referred to as diacritical marks and we're going to see the impact that these so-called diacritical marks have on our understanding of what scripture is saying because in a number of cases these Masoretes change the meaning of the words and thus changing the the meaning of the the scripture itself so we're going to be taking a look at that hang in there with us no we're not going to be doing a lot of yelling and cussing and acting a fool but i hope that you learned something tonight i also want to say that this lesson is dedicated to my beloved sister lynette june nettie martin who passed away a couple of weeks ago succumbing to cancer we love you and miss you netta yeah i called her netta most of the family called her netty but to me she was netta we love you netta and i want to send my thanks out to brother kenny and charlene and gloria and cece and herman and bobette and all the others to help that help make this possible and sending off our beloved sister and especially to my nephew and nieces Kimberly and Chris and Akisa I know it's tough but y'all hang in there y'all hang in there y'all bless and I also want to say that I want to thank y'all because Lynette called on the name of y'all before she she left we had a little on the phone Bible study and we talked about Yah and she was calling on the name of Yah. So I praise him for claiming this soul that we called Lynette Martin Davenport. Love you, Netta. See you soon. Tonight's scripture is going to be taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapters 23, verses 26 through 28. Verse 26. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for by all tonight we're going to be taking a yet closer look at these translators we're going to focus in on the old testament translators because i want to give you a feel for these men who actually lived although centuries ago uh, these people were real and we need to know who they are who they were what role they played 
these translators use what is called the Masoretic Text. And we're going to take a look a closer, a closer look at these Masoretic Texts and the Masorites who were scribes and they were uh, men who copied uh, pre-existing scriptures. That is, they took old scriptures relative to their time and they made copies of them. But we're going to see that these Masorites, these Masorites apparently had an additional agenda as they have made some very striking errors in these Masoretic texts. And why is that so important to us? Because it's the Masoretic text that was used as the source of the translation for all of your modern day Bibles. So any errors that were in the Masoretic text obviously would have been passed down to these more modern day Bibles, such as the KJV and the NIV and many others. We're going to take a look at some of the examples of these errors. All right, so let's get started with this. Hopefully we recall that there were 47 scholars who worked on this huge task of translating the various sources that uh, were used to translate into the KJV. We know that there were three sites and each site contained two committees. There are two committees at the Westminster site, two committees at the University of Cambridge, and two at the University of Oxford. The committees worked on certain parts separately and the drafts produced by each committee were then compared and revised for harmony with each other. The scholars were not paid for their translation work, but were given first consideration for well-paid positions as they became available. The Old Testament Translators Tonight we're going to read the names of these Old Testament translators. I'm not going to go into their bio in any detail because you can easily just pause the video and read them in detail yourself. But I think that you'll be quite impressed with the credentials of these men. All men, all white, who some of you want to refer to as Esau. But you're going to have a problem getting around the fact that Father Yah allowed these men the opportunity to translate his word from Hebrew into English so that these heathen Gentiles can could understand. So let's get started. At the first Westminster Committee, translating Genesis through 2 Kings were Dr. Lancelot Andrews. Dr. John Overall, Dr. Hadrian Saravia, Dr. Richard Clark, Dr. John Layfield, Dr. Robert Teach, Francis Burlig. He was known as an outstanding Hebrew scholar. Godfrey King, Richard Thompson, Dr. William Bedwell. He was known as the father of Arabic studies in England. He enrolled at Trinity College, Cambridge in 1578 when he was not quite 15 years of age. Now switching over to the first Cambridge committee, 
that were responsible for translating the books of Chronicles to the end of the Song of Songs. We have Edward Lively, Dr. John Richardson, Dr. Lawrence Catterton. Francis Dillingham, Dr. Roger Andrews, Thomas Harrison, Dr. Robert Spalding, Dr. Andrew Bing, switching over to the first Oxford committee that was responsible for translating Isaiah through Malachi. We have Dr. John Harding. Dr. Harding began his university education at Magdalen College, Oxford at the age of around 13 or 14. Then there was Dr. John Reynolds. Dr. Reynolds enrolled in Oriel College, Oxford at the tender age of eight years in 1557. Then there was Dr. Thomas Holland and Dr. Richard Kirby. Dr. Miles Smith, Dr. Richard Brett. He entered into Hart Hall, later renamed Hertford College in Oxford, when he was 15 years old. Then there was Daniel Richard Fairclough. Richard Fairclough became a student at Winchester College in 1565 when he was 12 years of age. These are the men who translated the Masoretic text into English from 1604 to 1611, creating the King James Bible, along with the books of the Apocrypha. But the translators that we have identified so far are just the translators for the Old Testament. We'll take a look at the translators for the, uh, the, the Apocrypha and the New Testament at a later date. But for those who have no understanding or little understanding of who these translators were, because I have never seen these men identified before, never. In all the years in going to the uh, Gentile Christian church and attending their Bible so-called studies, which I call Bible reading, because they really weren't really studying much of anything. They were reading words, but it certainly lacked in study and lacked in research. But these men translated from what is called the Masoretic text. So the question obviously is what is or are the Masoretic text? Well, there are two main sources of the Masoretic text. One is called the Aleppo Codex. The other is called the Leningrad Codex. We're going to focus our attention on the Leningrad Codex because it is the complete uh, Masoretic text, whereas there are significant portions missing from the Aleppo Codex. And that's a whole story in itself because these uh, Ashkenazi Jews apparently hijacked that material and hid it away somewhere as they've done so many of the source material. So we're going to be looking at the Masoretic text. We're going to be looking at these people called the Masoretes. We have to understand that these Masoretes copied from earlier copy. Now, what year are we talking about? We're talking about the years 500 through 1000 AD. 
500 through 1000 AD after the death of the Messiah 500 to 1000 years afterwards they copied texts that were available to them to them then creating what's called the Masoretic text but we're going to see that they did a little bit more than just simply copy they added what is known as vowel points or Nikud marks because Hebrew does not contain any vowels but there are vowel sounds so we're going to be taking a look at that now let's go on here we see a photograph of one of these Masorite scribes we see him copying uh, the uh, material that was his source into Masoretic text. Now, I don't know this man, don't know who he is, and really don't care. But we have to realize that there were people who called themselves Jews who were not. As Rome, uh, Revelations 2, 9 and 3, 9 points out very clearly. There are those who say they are Jews, but do lie, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Well, what would make a person pretend to be a Jew but be really of the synagogue of Satan. Well, one of the things that they would do, one of their motives would be to disclaim the messiahship of Yahusha to put in the mind of people that, that, that the man who we call Yahusha Hamashiach was just another man. You're just a regular guy in one of their documents they say it is better that one man die than the whole nation of Israel perish so they're very clearly willing to sacrifice a uh, innocent man and maybe that's why the scripture that 2 9 and 3 9 refer to these people as the synagogue of Satan Now, this sect of Jews called Masorites were performing their works during the periods of the year 500 to 1000 AD. Now, from their work, we have today two principal sources. One is called the Aleppo Codex, which dates back to 928 AD and is currently housed in a museum in Israel and the other is called the Leningrad Codex that was created about the year 1008 AD, which is currently in St. Petersburg, Russia. Now, we're going to focus on the Leningrad Codex for two reasons. One, because the Aleppo Codex is not complete. There was portions, there were portions that were destroyed uh, supposedly in a fire and by other sources it says that uh, there were uh, portions that were stolen and that were used uh, for a ransom but be that as it may the focus is on the Leningrad Codex which is complete now remembering that this dates back to 1008 AD 1000 years after the birth of the Messiah now, this Leningrad Codex served as the source of translation for almost all of your modern day Bibles. That includes your KJV, your, N, your new KJV, your American Standard Version, the uh, New International Version, and several others. Now, at a point later on, this becomes very important. Because we're going to see that there are some problems, some very serious problems with this Masoretic text. And principally coming from uh, not only just texts that were just omitted, 
excluded or changed, but the introduction of what is called uh, the Baal marks, or in Hebrew, they call it the Nikud, N-I-Q-Q-U-D marks. And I'll be showing you what those are in a minute. But first, let's take a look at the uh, photographs of the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex. Now here we're looking at the Aleppo Codex on the left, dating from 928 AD. And on the right, we have the Leningrad Codex dating from 1008 AD. Now, these are side-by-side -side comparisons. And if you look very closely, you will see these little marks, these little dots and dashes under the Hebrew letters. These are the vowel markings, the so-called vowel marks or vowel points, also called Nikud. Now, we're looking at Psalms 113 in verse 1. Now, the uh, a comparison of these two, the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex of Psalms 113 and 1, are virtually identical. But you can see that there are uh, uh, comments in the uh, in the columns and we have to realize that these comments were not there originally these are comments that were added by the Masorites and we also have to look and to see and understand about these vowel marks we're going to take a closer look at that next Before we take a look at the Nikud or the vowel marking, it's probably better that we start with a review of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, we should remember that there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and they're all said to be consonants. And also recall that we read Hebrew from right to left. So we're going to be reading these letters from right to left, dropping down to the next row right to left, dropping down to the next row, right to left, and a fourth time. Focusing in on the the highlighted symbols in yellow. Now I highlighted those in yellow for a reason, because there are other symbols on here which we're not going to address right now. The so-called sophit forms of the letters. We're not going to touch on those right now. And the Aramaic symbols. We're not going to deal with those right now. Yes, I know that there is uh, uh, the corruption that we call Yiddish brew. We understand that. I understand that. But we're not dealing with that right now. Okay, so let's just deal with these Hebrew alphabets. All right, these Hebrew letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Okay, starting with the upper right-hand side, we have the letter Aleph, then Beit, Gemel, Dalit, He, Ba or Wa, Zain, Ket, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamet, Mim, Nun, Samak, Ain, Pe or Fe, Sadi, Kof, Resh, Shin, Tav. Those are the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet said to be all consonants. Now, I just want to point out that letter sheen. Sheen. See the one that kind of looks like a W? If you will recall, for those of us who are old enough to recall, the movie Star Trek, the series Star Trek, and there was a character by the name of Spock played by Leonard Nimoy and Leonard Nimoy will oftentimes form his fingers into this pattern of three groups of fingers that's what he was doing he was presenting this Zionist Kabbalic demonic symbol of sheen 
It has special meaning in the Kabbalah. That's what he was doing when he was holding those fingers up. Now here we're showing a comparison of the two. The Hebrew letters on the left and the Masoretic Leningrad Codex with the vowel markings on the right. And by the way, this is still Psalms, a portion of Psalms 113 and 1. But this is the, the, the Masoretic text, Leningrad Codex. Now, if we look very carefully, we will be able to distinguish these, the individual Hebrew letters. But in so doing, you should also see that these additional markings at the bottom they can be at the bottom, they can be at the side, they can be inside the letters. They can be over the top of the letters. These, this is the system that these Masoretes came up with in order to control the pronunciation uh, of these words, where the accent lies, uh, where the, uh, how long it, uh, the symbol, syllables were to be uh, express were they short were they long uh, it uh, they're all and then in so doing they could control the meaning of the word without even changing the actual letters and we can see that this in the and we can see in the future that this is going to be a problem uh, this can be a problem and is a problem uh, which we will see a little later Oh, also down the right hand side, notice we have the, the again, the comments that were made by these Masorites back from 500 AD to 1000 AD. All of these things were being taken into account by these translators. So the problem with this is that we see that what is being translated is not necessarily translation of the words themselves, but also of the intent of the Masoretes, indicated by the, the vowel markings that they chose to place around these letters. Here we're looking at these Nakud or vowel marks themselves. These are the marks that were placed around the letters of the Hebrew alphabet in order to express how the Masoretes wanted the word pronounced, where the accents were to be made, how long the syllables were to be expressed, and in so doing, they could control the meaning of the word even without changing the letters that were being used. So it could very well be claimed that they accurately copied from their source to their Masoretic text letter by letter. But the fact that they added these Nakud marks, which ultimately ultimately control the pronunciation and the, 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 the way the word is expressed, they can control the meaning of the word. Here we're going to take a look at, at an example of the effects of these Nakud or vowel points. We're going to be looking at one word that has two different meanings and their meanings are determining are, are determined by the vowel marks themselves the letters in hebrew are ket lamet bet ket lamet bet one word means milk in one case the same word means fat in another well, which uh, uh, definition do you use? Two same words, same letters. The distinction is made by the Masoretes. Introduction and use of their Nikud vowel marks. 
the word milk with the Nakud marks that we have in blue is pronounced Kalab. Kalab, where the word meaning fat is pronounced Kaleb. Kaleb. Both have the same exact Hebrew letters pronounced a little differently, but the determination of that is being made by the Masorites. Now, that doesn't seem much of a problem because even in English we have words that are spelled the same uh, but are pronounced differently. The problem with this is that, remember, these Masorites are coming into the scene on the scene a thousand years after the birth of the Messiah. A thousand years after the birth of the Messiah. So how do you know with certainty that all of these Naku marks are being placed properly expressing the exact meaning that was intended thousands of years before them? Their answer is you don't. See, now they don't have to corrupt everything, but the possibility is there to corrupt something. And that's what we're going to find has taken place, that through these Naku marks, the meanings of words have been changed. In our previous example, we took a look at the words kalab, meaning milk, and the word kaleb, meaning fat. Now, both kalab and kaleb are spelled exactly the same way. Ket, lamet, bait. Ket, lamet, bait. Now, what distinguished milk from fat, kalab from kaleb, were the Masoretic vowel marks. It was the Masoretic vowel marks that gave us the definition of that of that word. Well, okay, we're talking about milk and fat, and one can say, okay, no big deal, milk and fat. Okay, but let's take a look at another word that is far, far more important than milk or fat. We're going to take a look at the tetragrammaton, or some say tetragrammation the four letters representing the name of our Creator. Those four letters are yod he wah yod he wah corresponding to the letters Y-H-W-H, Y-H-W-H, meaning Yahuwah, the name of our Creator. But when we look in the Masoretic text, we can see that those same four letters, yod he wah have the Masoretic vowel marks added to them. And in our second example here, in those, uh, uh, using those vowel marks, we see that this uh, representation of yod he wah is intended to be pronounced Adonai, Adonai. Adonai is often translated Lord, and Lord is coming from the pagan god Baal, as some would say, Baal. That's not a small thing. So you're taking the letters representing our creator's name, and you're corrupting it into some uh, the name of some pagan deity. Uh, this is blasphemy. This is why, this is certainly a reason why uh, the scriptures cause certain folks who say that they are Jews really of the synagogue of Satan. You'd have to be to introduce a system and marks into our creator's name, Yahuwah, and transform it without changing a letter into Adonai, Lord, Baal. But that's not all. We can see examples where the same four letters, yod heh 
with different vowel markings is to be pronounced Elohim. Well, Elohim is translated God, but it's also translated gods, which means plural, obviously. And being plural, it is they can be male gods or female gods. Again, this is blasphemous. This is a very, very serious matter. Now, with the word Elohim that they are using yod heh wah -Heh, if we actually spelled that letter out in the Hebrew, we would get this bottom example spelled Aleph, Lamet, He, Yod, Mim, Sophit. Aleph, la, uh, Aleph, Lamet, He, Yod, Mim, Sophit. That is the actual spelling of the word Elohim. But here they're taking the tetragrammaton, yod he wah -he, and changing that into Elohim. This is a very serious matter. This is nothing to be frowned upon or something to be taken lightly, excuse me. But if you think of all the many times in our King James Bible that you see the word God, Lord, or the combination of the two, Lord God. Think of the many times you've heard people praying, and in their prayer, they'll say, Lord God, Lord God, over and over, Lord God, and say something, you know, give me some shoes, some money, or bless me with this, something, something, Lord God, Lord God. They don't understand that what they're really saying is Adonai, Elohim, Adonai, Elohim, Lord, Baal, or Baal. I hope you're beginning to see what's going on with these Masorites and their Nikud marks. Here we have an example where our creator, our beloved creator, Yahuwah, yod -Heh -Wah -Heh, has been transformed without changing a letter, without changing a letter, has been translated into Adonai. Adonai meaning Lord and Lord coming from the pagan sun god, Baal or Baal. I hope you see what's happening and it's not good. Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 26 and 27. How long shall this be in the hearts of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Now we're going to identify some of the errors that are known to exist within the Masoretic texts that were propagated down into all the modern uh, Bibles uh, that were translated from this Masoretic text. The comparison is going to be made between the Masoretic and the Septuagint. Recall the, that the Septuagint is the original translation from Hebrew to Greek, dating back to 250 BC. Now, starting with Psalm 145 and 13, we read from the Septuagint, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful in his words and holy in all his works. That which you see highlighted in yellow is missing from the KJV, 
the uh, the new KJV, the NASB, the NIV, the NRSV, and the YLT, because all of these were based upon the Masoretic text. Our second example is from Genesis 46 and 26. There we read in the Septuagint, and all the souls that came with Jacob, Jacob into Egypt, who came out of his loins, besides the wives of the sons of Jacob, even all the souls were 66. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in the land of Egypt, were nine souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob who came with Joseph into Egypt were 75 souls. The Masoretic KJV says there were 70 people. 70 people. Let's take a look now at Isaiah 61 and 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to preach glad tidings to the poor, to heal the broken in heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of the sight to the blind. The And recovery of sight to the blind is missing in the Masoretic KJV. The next example of the Masoretic errors is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verse 40. In the Septuagint we read, And the sojourning of the children of Israel while they sojourned in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan was 430 years. And it came to pass after the 430 years all the forces of the Lord came out of the land of Egypt by night. Now this part, and the land of Canaan, was 430 years. This part of the passage was dropped entirely by the Masoretes. It is not found in the KJV, nor any of the other KJV, uh, or the other translations based upon the Masoretic text. The total time from Abraham coming into Canaan land until the Israelites left Egypt was 430 years. They, the uh, Israelites, did not spend 430 or even 400 years in bondage in Egypt. This is a gross corruption introduced by the Masoretes. Next example will be from Psalms 151. Psalms 151 is just entirely missing from the KJV, as well as Psalms 152, entirely missing from the Masoretic KJV. Our last example will be taken from Genesis chapter 11, verse 11 through 25. Now here there are many errors in the length of time that these people lived and the length of time uh, that uh, the, how, the age that they were when they begat uh, the next person in the genealogy. Here, so there's, there's too many to example, there's too many to record here. So we're just gonna give the example found on verse 12, which says, Arphazad lived 135 years and begat Canaan. Now, the Masoretic KJV says, and Arphazad lived five and thirty years and begot Salah. Of course, five and thirty years is thirty-five years. So you see in the Masoretic text, they just dropped off the 100 from the 135. And as you read through this, you will see that this is consistent when compared with the Septuagint. That is that rather than 140 years, 
the Maserati KJB will only list 40. If it's 150 years, the Maserati KJB will only list 50 years. So the end result of all of this is what? Here we've learned that there were those who were called Maserites who were operating between the years of 500 to 1000 AD. And they called themselves Jews. But as we've seen in scripture, there are those who say that they are Jews, but are not. So we have to be very, very cautious and very careful when we hear about those who say they are Jews. Because again, according to scriptures, it says that if they are those who are, say they are Jews, but are really of the synagogue of Satan. So we see that we have have that we have what's called the Leningrad Codex, the Leningrad Codex produced back in the year 1008 by these Masoretes, and it is the Leningrad Codex, which is the Masoretic text that was used by the translators that have been previously identified in this lesson. They are the ones who were using this Masoretic text, the Leningrad Codex, to translate and create what became known as the 1611 version of the KJV, the King James Version of the Bible. And at later times, others would take it upon themselves to translate from the same Masoretic text, producing the new KJV and the uh, NIV and the NASB and the ESV and others. The problem is the errors that were containing that were contained in the uh, Masoretic text have been translated into these Bibles. And how many times have I heard in past times that the Bible was the 100% unadulterated word of God, as was said back in those days. And now only had to find that it's not true. That the Masoretes, who very well could be identified as these fake, phony, and false Jews, added their Nikud marks changing our creator's name into uh, idolatrous names of the, uh, the heathen. But now you know, although you could have known anyway, because there are, other, there are other videos out there that have shared this kind of information. It's been out there for quite some time. But I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed researching it and bringing it to you. So brothers and sisters of Israel, brothers and sisters of Israel, may Holy Yah bless you many, many times over and praise Yah, Alelu Yah, who gave us Yahusha HaMashiach, that living sacrifice that living representation and fulfillment of the Passover, that Passover lamb that took away the sins of the world, the lamb of Yah who took away the sins of the world. To you and all of you, I say to you, Shalom, Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Until next time. Good night. Shout my name in the middle of the nation.
take the shield of faith and the sword of my tongue and declare my name to a dying world. He who has declared me thus far will walk in even greater power. For the sands of time are running out, but my name 